Let's take an early look at the Pilatus PC-12 accident. This one happened where a PC-12 with five people aboard, a single pilot, two medical professionals, a passenger, a patient, and a patient's family member, were departing Reno, Nevada, en route to Salt Lake City. About 14 minutes into the flight, the pilot loses control of the aircraft and it spirals down and crashes. All five people aboard perish. So what happened? We'll look at the conditions, the pilot, and the equipment. So we'll start with the conditions. They will almost certainly be a factor in this accident. A winter storm was passing through the Reno area. Visibility was about a mile and three quarters in light snow, and the temperature was negative one Celsius on the surface. So the pilot was departing in demanding conditions, single pilot, night, IFR, into turbulence and moderate icing. The pilot departs, as we can see from the profile here, and the first few minutes of the flight seemed to go normally. But then in the last minute or so, as the pilot levels off, he's en route to flight level 250. And at about 19,400 feet or so, according to ADSB data, the pilot loses control of the airplane. We can see it peel off to the right and then enter a spiral in, until the crash. The conditions were certainly demanding, and that kind of visibility in snow and ice. Now, the Pilatus aircraft is made for this kind of flying. It has FIKI, so flight into known icing capability. The fact that there was a SIGMET for turbulence and moderate icing en route would certainly have gotten the pilot's attention. He would have wanted to plan for that. So let's look at the likely causes or the things the NTSB will look at to investigate during this accident. The Pilatus, now this isn't a PC-12, but you can see the T-tail on this aircraft is like a Pilatus. It's, it's a high tail with a high horizontal stabilizer. If you look at stalls of a Pilatus, when a Pilatus stalls, it breaks off pretty aggressively in one direction or another. In the videos I saw, it would break off in more than 90 degrees of bank when it stalled. So if a Pilatus stalls, it is a pretty aggressive uh, stall response. We know the NTSB said that the aircraft broke up before it impacted the ground. And the NTSB said the horizontal stabilizer and the outboard right wing of the airplane broke off and they were found about a mile or so away from the impact site. That's how they know it came apart before it hit the ground. The NTSB mentioned they have difficulties. There's no recording devices on the airplane, but they may be able to download some data from the avionics inside the aircraft, and that's what we're hoping they can find. We mentioned the conditions will certainly be a factor in this accident. So from the time the aircraft departed, the pilot was in icing conditions. The SIGMET had tops of the potential icing up to 200. The pilot en route to flight level 250, but he never gets above 194 before he loses the aircraft. So if the icing systems weren't working, if the icing was so heavy that it overcame the icing systems in the Pilatus, or if the pilot was delayed in activating any of the icing systems, that could have caused a loss of control. The ice could have built up on the aircraft, on the wing structures and the tail so fast and so rapidly. Or if the ice built up inside the engine and the inertial separator wasn't engaged in time or appropriately, then reduced thrust could have happened and it could have choked the engine. So those factors could have been a cause of why the aircraft didn't climb above 19.4 and why the pilot lost control. The second issue that could have happened is after the pilot loses control of the airplane, then pulled incorrectly, I should say, or too aggressively, then he could have snapped off the horizontal stabilizer in the right outboard wing. In that case, that would have made the aircraft unrecoverable. And in fact, looking at ADSB data, we can see that it's an aggressive descent profile. Once the aircraft departs, it goes into a very nose-low spiral which indicates at some point the aircraft had come apart and was now uh, completely unairworthy. The other factor in the environment that day was turbulence. Turbulence over that part of the country can get pretty aggressive pretty quickly. It's a potential that the turbulence caused the breakup of the aircraft. 
and turbulence caused the horizontal stabilizer to depart in that right outboard wing, and that's what initiated the loss of control sequence. So icing or turbulence are the factors that may have caused the loss of control to begin with. A third factor is the potential for spatial disorientation. The pilot is flying single pilot. It's at night. It's in IMC conditions and light blowing snow. That can be disorienting to a pilot. And if for some reason the pilot got disoriented and lost control due to spatial disorientation and then in the recovery maneuvered inappropriately or too aggressively and snapped those control surfaces off, that's another potential cause of the, of the loss of control in the crash. In the NTSB, we'll try to determine that as well. So what are the lessons learned that we can take away as pilots from what we know so far? First is to think heavily about the conditions that you're going to fly into. Night, IMC, blowing snow, icing conditions, turbulence, and all of that single pilot IFR. That is as demanding as it gets in GA, as demanding as it gets in any kind of flying. So the go no-go de no -go decision and whether or not we would fly in those conditions is something to think hard about. And a consideration for us to think about under this accident is to make sure we understand our icing equipment. Is it anti-ice or de-ice? In this case, this was a Fiki-equipped airplane, flight into known icing. To make sure that we get ahead of that anti-icing and de-icing because almost all of those systems anticipate you being ahead of the icing conditions or knowing that they're coming. So if the pilot got into icing, it was difficult to see, maybe it was accumulating faster than he realized if he didn't get on his icing equipment and get onto that early and have it be preventive enough or to de-ice the airplane in time, then that certainly could have caused degraded performance. Icing degrades everything about performance in an airplane. It can degrade the thrust inside your engine or on your propeller. It certainly degrades the lift. It adds more drag, it adds more weight. So icing conditions are problematic. This accident reinforces how important it is that if you know you're going to fly into icing conditions to make sure you're ahead of your icing equipment and get in front of it. Since this accident brings up icing considerations, another thing for us to review is the minimum airspeed during a climb in icing conditions. That can be an insidious problem for pilots and what happens is a lot of airplanes have a minimum climb speed so that your angle of attack doesn't get such that ice builds up underneath the control surfaces. Now I don't know if a PC-12 has a minimum climb speed in icing conditions to it, but it reinforces the point that as pilots we need to check to see if our POH has such a limitation and if it does the importance of adhering to it. And then the potential for spatial disorientation. So let's try to put ourselves in the cockpit of this pilot. He's in an airplane that's not performing as he's expecting. There's some, a, a, it's a high workload involved in the flying. He's working his icing equipment. He's on a departure. And now suddenly if he goes heads down and the aircraft rolls off in some kind of unusual attitude, how insidious that can be to catch up to you. So it reinforces the need for a cross check. It reinforces the understanding of how that can happen and the importance of seeing it, identifying it, verifying it, and then inputting the correct uh, recovery response. So again, spatial D, single pilot operations in blowing snow in these kinds of conditions would have been a potential factor. So we'll keep tracking this as NTSB releases a preliminary report and more information. Stay tuned. Thanks for supporting AOPA and thanks for watching.